Well, hello. Hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's virtual Thursdays at the Figgy series. We're thrilled that you could join us tonight for this very special program. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education here at the Figgy. Um, for the time being, we are hosting these virtual programs. We're hosting in-person programs. We're hosting hybrid programs like tonight, nearly every week. So please be sure to check out the Figgy's website for topics and to register. Tonight's program is sponsored by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Thank you both so much for that, for your ongoing support of the Figgy, and of course, for our Thursday program series support. I'd also like to thank the organizers of the Alternating Currents Festival. Alternating Currents is partnering with us for tonight's program. And for those of you who are local, make sure to check out some of the other great programs happening throughout the Quad Cities this weekend. I think there's something like 100 performances um, special events and music, uh, musical performances, as well as theatrical ones going on. And then of course, films like what we have tonight. Yeah, come on in. So tonight we are joined by audiences both in person and online for this hybrid presentation of the opera film, Divide Light, followed by a virtual presentation by award-winning film director, Ed Robbins. For those of you here in the museum's auditorium, we will play the film on the big screen and then project Ed's live virtual presentation on that same screen. That'll be by way of Zoom. You'll have a chance to ask questions. We hope to make this as conversational as possible. For those of you joining us on Zoom tonight, you'll receive a link in the chat to watch the film on Vimeo. After watching the film, play, oh, there it is. Thank you, Kelsey. I also wanna thank Kelsey Vanderkoy, who is our IT specialist here, not really. She's one of our great outreach educators, but during the pandemic, Kelsey has taken over all of this and really embraced it. So Kelsey has put that link for Vimeo into the chat. You're going to watch the film using that if you're on Zoom. It's going to be a much clearer picture. So once you are finished, we'll tell you when to start it. Don't do it yet. Once you're finished watching the film by way of that link, you'll then return to your Zoom screen where you're watching me now, and that's where you'll hear Ed's presentation. Those on Zoom will also be able to interact with Ed through the chat and Q&A functions. This is the first time we're hosting a program of this nature in this format. So thank you in advance for your patience as we switch from one portion of the program to the next. So before we transition to the film part of the program, I did want to share a few words about it. This film, Divide Light, by award-winning filmmaker Ed Robbins, portrays the original opera created by artist Leslie Dill and composer Richard Marriott. Leslie Dill, of course, has her exhibition, Wilderness, Light Sizzles Around Me, on display at the Figgy through August 22nd. That is on level three. There's still a chance to see it. So maybe after tonight's program or over the weekend, you can, you can go up there. The film Divide Light contemporizes the works of poet Emily Dickinson, linking the groundbreaking ideas of the mid 19th century American transcendental movement to innovations and global concerns in today's rapidly changing world. As I mentioned, following the film, Ed Robbins will give a virtual talk about the filmmaking process from its technical aspects to the moments of artistic inspiration behind the film's creation. So with that, you have the Vimeo link in the Zoom chat. And for those of us who are here at the Figgy, we're going to dim the lights. So everyone get comfortable enjoy the film, and then we're going to see you back here, for those of you on Zoom, in this Zoom, in just over an hour. I think it's an hour and seven minutes, and that's when we're going to hear from Ed Robbins himself. So we will see you then. Well, welcome back, everyone. We hope you thoroughly enjoyed watching Divide Light. I'm going to adjust the lighting here just for a second. Okay, better. Thank you. All right, yes, we hope you enjoyed the film. We're so glad that you stuck around for the, the next exciting part of this program. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Ed Robbins. Ed is a multi-award winning documentarian who has worked as a writer, director, and also as a one-man band in numerous crisis zone regions. His decades of work include a profile of soldiers during Iraq's civil war. In Kabul, he captured the story of a young girl in a circus school for children 
In Pakistan's Northwest Territories, he explored the Taliban's grab for political power. Of course, all of this is, is ever centered as we, as we go through, as we watch current events unfold um, these days. Working across the world and throughout America, various media outlets such as PBS, BBC2, Channel 4, UK, National Geographic, The New York Times, Time Magazine, The Discovery Channel, ABC, NBC, WCBS, and other leading outlets have commissioned Ed as a writer-director. He's a fine arts college graduate who conceived and directed the many animations that form the backdrop for Divide Light, which I'm sure you noticed and enjoyed this evening. His art films include profiles of musicians, artists at work, and performances that have been shown in dozens of museums across the USA. Since 2011, he has been an adjunct professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. With that, it is my extreme pleasure to, to present to you Ed Robbins, and please join me in welcoming him. Hi, all. Thanks so much for coming to this event. And um, a special thanks to all those at the Alternating Currents Festival for including this film, and especially those at the Figgy Museum, like Melissa has been just so proactive and, and done such great work on Leslie's exhibition, um, which is Leslie's work is at the core of all of this actually. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes or so about the animations and then about the making of the film and what you know, went into doing it that's a little different than just documenting the piece. And I'm gonna put that on um, just one second. I have to switch gears to, hopefully this will work. Hopefully everyone is now seeing PowerPoint. I hope that's working. So, um, I, um, I, of course, have to step back to give accolades to Leslie Dill, who the artist at the Figgy right now, and she is the one who conceived and created the piece. Composer Richard Marriott, you know, did such a brilliant job of doing the music in collaboration with her. And um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the creative evolution of the piece and more about the film, which is closer to what I've done. And what you've seen is not just a reproduction in my mind of the performance, but I hope a thing unto itself that captures the spirit of the piece. And there's two parts I'll talk about. Uh, first about the developing the animations that go into the background sets, and then the special challenges of the film, and then take any questions you have. Uh, you can send them by chat to Melissa. To Melissa. Um, I have two screens going, so you may see my eyes flickering to the PowerPoint slides to my side. But um, Ed, Ed, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're not seeing your screen share right now. Not seeing I didn't know if you share. had if you had tried. Okay, let me try that again. Thank um, you. Are you seeing uh, it now? Yep, we got it. Thank you. Okay, great. Perfect timing. So um as Melissa told you, I'd done documentaries as a writer director, sometimes shooter and editor. And for years I did many in what could be called crisis zones, including in places like, um, like Iraq, so um, during the war. So some of you know that, but some may ask, how did I go from filming on the back of a tank in Iraq to Emily Dickinson and the opera? And for me, that helps to be married to Leslie Dale, because uh, in truth, I studied fine art as well, not film and not journalism. And I've done several films with Leslie over the years. And Leslie's ties to Emily Dickinson run decades deep. She did a deep immersion into Emily Dickinson's works for many years. And she's been known for her art images that link the text and image uh, to Emily Dickinson's amazing texts and um, the book she used to be inspired by has just fallen to pieces uh, from being paged through so much. And, and that's what led to the idea of the opera, uh, an opera not on Emily Dickinson's life in any way, but Leslie was insistent that it be just on her words because her words are um, so 
incendiary and, and fascinating. And it was not to be an opera in the kind of grand European scale of things with, but she wanted that operatic voice and uh, to marry that with a more performance approach. And the words Leslie has curated for her pieces over the years are just so much more uh, strange and mystical and bent and, and evocative than the kind of um, image that some people have of Dickinson's work. And Leslie has really been inspired by and culled that work and formed the 20 songs that go into this piece. Uh, she uh, previously had collaborated uh, working on other musical projects that ended up on CDs with choirs and such, but this was an entirely bolder scale. And that's when she connected with Richard Maria, the brilliant composer who composed ideas and words while working with Leslie into a very long process uh, with several grants to create Divide Light. And to do that, they didn't just create a song cycle, they developed a storyline, an arc, going from vulnerability and fear to the transformation and the finale of ecstasy. Um, so, where it comes to me is when the question came about, what about the sex? And Leslie had an idea of projections behind the performance. Uh, she was looking at abstract colors and shapes, but you know, over time that gets quickly repetitive and can be boring. And she turned it over to me um, for something more narratively driven. Um, and from the start, um, in our discussions, I wanted to um, drive things with her work and do it uh, with kind of an arc to each piece. And I had gone to um, art school, but I also after school did a number of animations for Reading Rainbow and, and other places. I directed animations and did animations. And um, I said, okay, so I knew Leslie's body of work and most of its painting and sculpture, but she had a period of time when she did a lot of photos and, and many of those were turned into art and painting. And I also, um, she in her print work often uses layering and all this is very pre Photoshop. It's all kind of um, created um, by hand. So this is uh, one of the pieces, I think this may be at Museum of Modern Art. It's about seven feet tall. Um, this is typical of a combination of text and image. So these are the kind of pieces I started looking at. Um, and I knew there were photos available of the originals and I, I wanted to use those as the animated backgrounds. And I could bring life to these with some sort of limited animation. And I started making selections from the photos that somehow to me in some way fit with a particular poem that the song was highlighting. Um, uh, sorry, one second. Um, and so um, I had to find my material in this and I poured through about 200 images and some finished artworks. And I, um, I then had to figure out how to add words to this. And I, how to create a story out of this. And so I started to um, create storyboards, which those familiar with um, those familiar with animation, you you create every few seconds, you create an image of what it will be. And I just started working with PowerPoint, creating these storyboards. And I set up some rules. And um, as a story is a journey. A journey needs rules and it needs consistency. And the rules and restrictions actually help to define the ideas. And it needed a cohesion among all, all these desperate images. So I decided, um, discussing it with Leslie, that we decided on one image per song. And we both agreed it would move very, very slowly. That the smooth kind of seamless transitions of animation that transform, 
transformative quality could really um, be appropriate because we've both seen so many performances with very fast cut, very you know, elaborate videos. And um, I have intended to like those. I think they pull you away. And we wanted a more meditative state for this opera. A lot of it is about possession, possession by words, a meditative unfolding. And I wanted people's minds to be able to kind of drift in and out of the background rather than being forced to like constantly follow it by the flickering that you're automatically drawn to of edits. So um, we ran through these slides and um, I started to select my repertoire for each song. And uh, Leslie created the storyline, pinned these up on the wall next to her developing arc. And um, each one, I then developed the storyboard of how it would unfold. And I, I took these images and um, keep in mind that each song has a duration. So one of the challenges was, well, how long is this animation? How many transitions does there have to be? How many transformations does it have to go through? So here's the typical images. Uh, one of the first ones I started with of Leslie's dress image. And so I got the idea of just drifting it slowly, slowly, slowly down. You don't even know what this shape is as it descends behind the dancers for a long time, maybe 30, 40 seconds before you start to realize what it is. And then you run out of time. So then I have to be creative and come up with other ways to multiply and change this as the song changed. And that's how the restrictions of the rules led to more ideas as I animated them. And then the text has to be added. So in this case, text emerged from her hand in this flowing kind of snake-like move. And in this case, this woman's tongue, it slowly pulled her across the stage as the dancers were singing. And um, I also wanted a consistent way to announce the title of each song. So Leslie and I agreed that there would be a, a title that would be animated and you saw those um, just simple titles, but each song had a different treatment and each song was announced with a title before the animation starts. So those were kind of the parameters of where, um, where we started. Um, but, you know, this is a typical thing. And then we get to this point, which is kind of getting beyond what I can physically do. Uh, you need After Effects, you need a lot of knowledge and I needed someone to help. And that's when uh, we were able to link up with these really incredible graduate students, uh, Laura Oxendine and Ben uh, Shellpeffer, who just took my storyboards and ran with them in incredible ways. This is 10 years ago now, when the first production was done in California. And um, very early for After Effects, it took all night to render some of these, just letting the computer run as it chunked away. Um, and they did really an amazing job of, of just running with the basic ideas I had given them. So huge kudos to them. And um, I kept inventing transformations. This is a typical example of something I gave them. It had the strings coming out of her face that back in the day before Photoshop, it was actually glued to her cheeks and for an image of Leslie's and had the idea of like running the words like, down the power lines. And so they created this you know, wonderful animation of the words just flowing into her face. And here's what they brought to the table. I mean, they brought this just flow of you know, text blurring and then it all multiplied and, and, and transformed with the uh, costumes and the light on the costumes and the, the flow of the dancers and the movement and these unfurling kinds of um, events that Leslie had uh, conceived of. Um, so Leslie made her comments, we developed this and um, the original opera was a performance in 2008 in California with a 45 person choir and a string quartet, a dozen performers and a giant stage with a light grid. It was very exciting. Um, but it was also um, 
before HD video. And I have a film of this, but the new production was done in a smaller, more intimate space. And the performers were all, eight performers who all had the operatic voices you've heard. So it was a different, for uh, Richard Marriott, we composed some of the songs. And um, it played for three nights and I filmed three nights and a rehearsal with multiple cameras. Um, and uh, then came, you can see one of those cameras glowing down here. Um, and then came the hard part. Um, I had to edit. And the editing took many, 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 many months. There was tons of footage that I shot and it was quite complex because um, for one, um, they were singing different tempos each time they sang the song. So um, they, in mixing maybe 20 camera angles together, um, I had to hand sync one frame at a time, moving left or right to the soundtrack that I had chosen from the, the particular song I thought I had given the best performance. And that happened every four or five seconds. I would have to just adjust, adjust, adjust. And that was all manual. That was all painstaking. And, um, and this is a chart I created of the different angles these each represent one of the different cameras on a different night from different, from high, from low, from the side. And I just had to dig through those footage and keep evolving. And I definitely knew I wanted to go beyond just documenting the work. I really wanted to create a kind of visceral experience of what the human animal does when we're watching a performance. We don't just sort of sit back and, and absorb that whole big wide screen shot. We, we're constantly hunting for what our attention is grabbed by. We're constantly looking at a face or drifting to the background or looking at the musicians at a certain point. And somehow we're just weaving our way through this experience. And I also that sort of meditative um, transcendental approach that Leslie takes in her work and in this piece, it's very evident as well as Richard Marriott's composing with its background in, in um, Indian and Indonesian um, music traditions, as well as classical. It has that, that repetitive movement of a meditation. And um, I wanted to also create a kind of something else, not just a documentation, something that had a feeling of its own as a film. And that's why I got to this layering of all those film pieces. About 12 minutes, 15 minutes of the piece on what's called a timeline. So the top part is the video. There's about 10 layers, eight layers here of video. Each of these is a line of video and each of these little boxes is a little two or three second clip of video that I've hand cut and moved into place there and carefully layered and layered and layered. And each of these dots are hand placed and these are special effects that I hand maneuvered into that. So this is just 12 minutes out of it. On the bottom, you can see is the soundtrack, which I was just, these little dots are all also hand put in and they're raising and lowering, you know, the various dynamics of the piece of music to fit uh, the different tracks that were taken and also to get it in sync. And um, so that was a technical challenge. And, oops, sorry. And another challenge is a little technical, but um, it's, I think, interesting for people to know a little bit what goes on behind the scenes. Um, so this is a color correction table. Each of these dots is a little animation. And what it's animating is this little mask that I've surrounded the figure with by hand. And as she moved every few seconds, I'd have to move each of these dots so it moved with her. Because the lighting was uh, changed to a scheme of night to dawn. And that doesn't, night doesn't really go very well for video, especially with spotlights on people. 
Plus I had a video shining behind them and that's a different color and a different look and it was extremely difficult. This is what the image looked like before I worked on it. You can see how blurry and overexposed and then you have a different exposure for the, uh, the person and the musicians and uh, lights shining right into the camera. Um, and this is what it looks like after I've masked it and worked on it for some hours. So that's what went into it. You can see here's more masking of the floor, masking of individuals um, as they moved. Each of those dots moves with them. Person in the center is masked. Every single person here was masked throughout the film. And then the layering, the, the idea of the layering really um, sort of took off as I worked on it, this idea of the text becoming a real element that they just sort of engulfs them. And you see that in the poster and you saw that in the film, how they just sort of drift in and out of this world, uh, like Leslie's work does in, in, in bringing together these layers of, of text almost as an incantation rather than just as a um, set of words or letters on the screen. Um, and here's another example of that kind of, you know, you saw that that layering was just sweeping them away and, 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 and engulfing them. And that's not the experience of the people in the theater, but it sort of captures the feeling you had watching it. So this is what it ended up with, a simpler timeline when I trimmed it down and made my choices. Um, and um, that is uh, basically the story of how it came together. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you. Ed, we can't even imagine what, ma what a massive undertaking that was. So thank you for kind of um, shining light on that. That's the consensus here in Davenport. So I don't know if there's any questions. Usually on Zoom, there's not that many. Um, we do have a question to... from the audience here. And I did I see that we have something in the Q&A. So with the audience here, they were wondering if this, if you have a, fa a part that was your favorite to work on that just came together seamlessly. And, and oh my God. You... Well, there's parts that are my favorite. I mean, that's a good question. I'm, uh, there are parts that, um, just the song is just so beautiful. It was just so kind of inspiring to like work with that rhythm of, and the performers were so tremendous in their movements and, and their singing um, as it switched off. I mean, I love Beauty Crowds Me Till I Die. Um, I especially, I mean, I, I really, um, I really love this piece. Um, um, I think it's the flowers on my, the blossoms on my hand are full of morning glory. Um, and I love power. To be alive is power. It's very powerful where the dress unfurls and in the background, it just like that massive face of uh, just comes at you uh, on the screen. Um, and uh, those I thought, you know, but there's some of the more quiet ones that was just the solo singer that, um, that I just found simple and, and beautiful to work with. So it's, it's very hard. They were also different, but thank you for the question. And then we have something in the chat or the Q&A. How long did it take to do this? And then kind of along those lines, what was that process like? For example, did you work late at night, all night? And were you, were you doing this in um, just by itself? Whoever or were you asked on that question. Well, there's two questions, but... Um... Whoever asked that question probably is a plant and knows me. Uh, yes, there were many actually nights I stayed up all night working on this. Um, as you can see, it's just invisibly, incredibly handmade. And um, there's just thousands. And I mean, at a certain point, I just realized the technical problems I was facing and realized the creative challenges I wanted to meet. And at a certain point, I just surrendered to it and said, okay, eight, nine months of editing and uh, 10, 12 hour days are very typical 
um, very typical. So yeah, it's, a, it's just, even just organizing the material probably took a week, you know, just organizing it, getting in the computer, putting it in order, screening it, making decisions about which shot goes with what, um, with 12, 20 choices to go from for a given moment. So um, even that decision making is, is a moment. It's a little like a video game though, right? You're only looking ahead a minute or two. So you get, oh, it's, it's two o'clock, but I, I can do this next, yeah, I can do that minute. So um, yeah, it's editors tend to be very obsessive and, uh, and uh, that keeps you going, that sort of challenge and it's minute to minute. So that kind of second to second, minute to minute is what keeps you going. Well, thank goodness for that, because it's truly a gift that you've given us with this, this film and also tonight. All right, so Ed, can you speculate on what you might have learned from the documentaries you made, like the Iraq film, that you carried over to the films that are more impressionistic, more suggestive than a mode that's directly narrative? Hmm, I'd have to think about that for a second. It's a really interesting question. Um, it's Tom's question, it says. Oh, figures. Um, <laughs> I think the, the films I do, for those few of you who are actually familiar with um, films I've done, they're very driven by people. And they're, I don't, uh, rather than pundits or rather than a political message or um, a policy issue in writ large on the screen. I have done much more humanistic approaches. Even the film on the Iraq war uh, was very unjudgmental as in terms of what the soldiers were doing as about their job. So I, I have always looked close at the individual as a place to tell a story and or group of individuals. And um, and there's a very uh, immediacy in the filming of it because it's happening and unfolding so quick that is akin to theater. If something explodes near you, you just have to react to that as it happens and unfolds. Frame it, compose it, think about it. Um, you know, these are very indirect, but despite the chaos, I am trying to create a semblance of my own vision out of the unfolding reality, even in a war situation, I am thinking, don't run, frame it the way you want to, listen to the sound, what's happening around you, look to the side, look to the left, where are you going to go next with the camera, what do you need to capture, there's all these thoughts coming in that are very akin to trying to track a theatrical piece where, I mean, I didn't memorize this piece, I was working night and day on a television show and I just showed up for the rehearsal. I'd seen it evolve at home, but I hadn't memorized these songs and I certainly hadn't memorized the movements of the actors on stage because I only was privy to the rehearsal like the day before uh, the day I started shooting. So, which I did on my own for the close-ups. And so I couldn't possibly memorize 20 songs and all those movements. So there's a lot of elements of, you know, having to just try to catch things as they're unfolding. So that's a long answer to what might be some overlaps in um, the two. That's fascinating, really. We have um, another question from the audience that's with us, but I think first we're gonna go to one in the chat that says, I was me mesmerized, I was mesmerized. What do you think Emily Dickinson would have thought of this film and opera? Um, <laughs> hard to speculate on what old Emily would think. Um, the attention alone probably would have sent her running, but um, I think it respects, above all, what Leslie has always recognized many years before many people did of the, I mean, other than academics and people who are in the English world and study her and more familiar with her work, um, is there's just a transcendentalist inner core married to her experience of the Civil War, which paraded past her front door in the funerals of the young men from her town um, 
you know, in a kind of drumbeat. Um, there was many, many people killed in the Amherst uh, uh, section from the Civil War. And so it was really then that her work, especially the work that Leslie often uses, really took off. And um, if I were to think what she, what her reaction would be to this, I think it would be an appreciation of that effort to marry the transcendental with the imagery of transcendence and the ending on ecstasy, despite the pain and um, sorrow of life. And she always turned it around as dark as she could get. And she could get very dark, very dark. But she always found that glimpse of ecstasy that Leslie chose to end this on. And, um, and I think she would be satisfied, I hope, with those aspects of this piece. Thank you. Thank you for that thoughtful answer, Ed. We do have another one here in the chat. How were you influenced by the music? Oh, well, music, I mean, editing is rhythm and filmmaking is rhythm and music is rhythm and um, it's uh, complete influence. I mean, complete influence. I'm sort of, it's almost like a kind of a trance state when you're doing this, deciding, you know, I don't, almost think about what shots needed. I kind of have a sense of I need, I need, I need based on sort of the rhythm and the, also the rhythmic movements of the people. You know, there's a rhythmic movement in there that matches the music. So both those rhythms together define when I decide to edit and how I edit and what images seem appropriate. And that makes perfect sense, especially getting into this trance with the sound. Thank you. And okay, the speed, so right? Some of them, I really sped up the editing. Some of them, I really slowed down. Um, we do have one final question from our live audience here, and that is, what are you excited to be working on now or coming up next? And how has the pandemic impacted that plan? Um, so... Uh, I will uh, share that um, I am no longer and have not for a few years been running around in the uh, in the backwoods or uh, through Africa or the Middle East or Afghanistan or Pakistan or Iraq. I, I haven't done that in a few years. I actually spent a number of years uh, doing true crime stories, <laughs> directing crews of people and actors recreating uh, crime stories for television. Uh, after um, doing this very running around on my own work. Um, and then uh, the teaching has kind of increasingly taken over as I, uh, in the last two or three years, uh, I always kept the, the television going in the background. So to answer the question, I did one piece in the beginning of COVID when it was really bad with a restaurant. I stumbled on down the street that had like 20 ambulances parked in front of it in my neighborhood. And I wondered why. And I started talking to the ambulance people and the person who was in the restaurant and she turned out she was giving food to them and giving food to the hospitals. So I created a film out of that. Um, and I also um, have created a number of films with Leslie. Um, as I am no longer doing television at this point. Um, so I'd already kind of dropped out of television about a year or two ago. It's hard to keep track. Um, so um, my latest is, I, I just came back from Wisconsin where I was shooting a film with Leslie about a series of prints uh, she's making at Tandem Press in Wisconsin. Um, so, and I, there's a number of short films. Uh, so yeah, I'm not doing that kind of work and I have a lot of, mentoring of uh, documentary students at Columbia Journalism School and China. I'm working with China as well. Okay, we did have one more question. Is that okay? Do you have time? Sure. Wonderful. It's about the, the masks hanging in your background. Are those from your travels? And are, they Yeah, look like I, I had a rule for a long time and I may have to break it because it's hard to travel now that I would uh, only gather things uh, uh, from places I've been. So there's Mexican and African and um, Guatemalan different masks that I've collected. And on another part of the wall, there's all these Uzbekistan things. And we have a collection of textiles that are sort of hidden here, but they're 
And they're all sort of crammed into my office because our loft has lots and lots of windows and less wall space than our last loft. So um, yeah, those are from my travels. That's wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Ed, for sharing with us your, your talent and passion tonight with our audiences here in Davenport, the Quad Cities, as well as our audiences from across the country online. I know many of you who are here in the Quad Cities want to go back and either revisit or visit for the first time the exhibition on level three. Just a reminder, you can only do that until August 22nd. So just a few more days before it hits the road for its next venue. We're very lucky we're the first of six locations where the exhibition will be on view. So if you do plan to visit the Figgy in person, please remember to check our website for up-to-date information on visiting hours and current policies, such as the recently reinstated mask mandate for all visitors, staff, and volunteers, regardless of vaccination status. Again, thank you so much, Ed, for sharing this wonderful program with us tonight. Thank you to our audience members for joining another presentation from our Thursday program series. We look forward to seeing you at future programs and maybe even in the museum. And we, have a, we hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night and thanks again. Thanks to you, Melissa. Bye. Thank you.